Good evening. Welcome to our student panel discussion. I'm Professor Joanne Lee from the Communication Department. Along with me is my colleague, Christine Kelly, Professor of Political Science and Director of the American Democracy Project. We've also invited students to join us this evening. We have communication student, Christina Torres, Wyatt Mays, and Maria Zuniga, and political science students, Kelly Ross, Haru Ramos, and Anna Guarino. Welcome. Professor Kelly. Well, um, it, very interesting to hear the student question tonight from the audience on student debt, something I know is near and dear to your hearts. Um, and the, there were a couple other moments when I think the um, major issues that are confronting you in your daily lives were raised. So I'm, I'm curious why when we have almost 1.4 million young people of voting age, yet only last gubernatorial race, only 220,000 came out to vote. Um, and those were split, you know, between the parties. Um, what do you think is the cause of that? Um, parties are supposed to compete for votes. Do you feel that the parties are doing enough to compete for your vote? I think young people, go ahead, I'm sorry. Definitely not. I think that the both, both parties are neglecting the youth vote. I think they're not talking about, now this debate was different. They did talk about student debt and things that students care about, but in previous elections, in previous, every candidate has kind of neglected the issues that you, youth people, youth votes, youth voters are, care about. They haven't talked about student debt. They don't talk about things that we want to. They kind of forget about us. We feel like we are left to the wayside. Um, I agree with her. I feel like the candidates, yes, they are coming to um, campuses and they are trying to have a connection with us, but overall, we are millennials. Our presence is on platforms such as social media, and I feel like they haven't done enough to generate awareness through that platform. Absolutely. Exactly. Young people do care about politics. We just dislike it, and it's partially because of apathy, frustration, and ignorance. Many of us don't owe TVs, therefore we miss the vast majority of political advertisement. Um, and half of us who are registered don't associate or affiliate ourselves with a certain party because they don't address the issues that we mostly care about. As my partner said, student debt, um, the DACA um, reform that we the hat has not been addressed today on the, today's debate. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting that, you know, we are here at William Patterson University, and this was a campus that did host a debate, yet neither of the candidates ever showed up to actually talk to us and see how we feel. And considering that they did come here and they did have their formal debate, they didn't show up. Um, young people generally want to be engaged. Uh, we thrive on people asking us how we feel, and we want to talk to people. And if you don't do that, then how could you expect us to come out the vote? What I think another, engaged you? I'm sorry, I finished? I think another important thing is that the youth vote is very misrepresented in the polls. Um, it's, it's almost completely untapped. Most polls are taken by, I think we've discussed this too, home phone calls. Uh, you know, this mm -hmm. is something that's targeting a different demographic completely. I think social media could be used, but I mean, you know, think of how many times a student or someone our age probably, uh, you know, will take a, a poll on BuzzFeed to find out which, you know, friend's character you are. But yet, we're not being tapped into to find out, you know, which, which way or which uh, policies actually matter to us. Well, let me ask you, which of those questions thrown out there, and there were a lot, property taxes, uh, sanctuary city, Atlantic City, transportation, transportation gaming in the Meadowlands, what Public. were those key points that you felt were relevant to swaying your mind either way to either candidate? I want to jump in on student debt, uh, specifically Phil Murphy, because he's the first political candidate that I ever heard that actually said that he would give out eight to ten eight to ten thousand dollars just for s going to school in New Jersey. I've never heard any political candidate actually say that before, and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, but the other side of student debt is that it's great for people that is five younger than me, five years younger than me, but not so great for me right now, who's going to walk away with a very high amount of debt, unfortunately. Anybody else? Besides student debt, transportation? 
this is the issue that none of the things that are relevant to us and student debt was briefly touched um, according to budget and policy report um, in 2007 and 2008 spending on higher education nationwide is 23 percent down and this leads schools and universities to raise their tuition and therefore gives us more debt this wasn't addressed or this wasn't mentioned which leads us to frustration and ignorance. By the way, the, you know, that is for the national level, but at the states it's worse. In other words, states have cut, in addition to fed, losing federal funding, states have cut it. So um, I think we did hear something new from Murphy tonight or something that is unique, which is the loan forgiveness for five years of staying in the state. Did anybody catch that? Yeah. Yes. So that would affect you, and I was actually surprised. and. Uh, I wondered what you were thinking about that. I wonder if that's going to be scaled for people who have higher uh, GPAs, for example. Um, not everyone who goes to college, unfortunately, has a high enough GPA. Um, so I'm wondering if that would be scaled. That's kind of my big so, question. So only students who get A's should get debt relief? <laughs> I think everyone deserves debt relief, but I believe if you go to college and you do and you put in the work and you do get good grades, then I think it should be awarded higher than people who go to school and, you know, just party all the time. I think an important thing that we're kind of missing too is that it's not just students generally, but if you think about students that are are trying to get a degree in education, what are the incentives to keep them here in the state if we have a solvency problem where we can't honor the pensions that are being promised? If we can't, you know, if we can't figure out the solvency problem, we can't figure out how, if, you know, it's not just a matter of lowering property taxes. Property taxes don't generally affect students or people at younger ages. So, I mean, Again, I think, again, this goes back to the pensions, and I think that we need to find another way of revenue coming into the state, and the only way that you could do that is by fixing the tax code, and there's a lot of different methods. <laughs> I think uh, the two candidates made very specific uh, positions regarding taxation. Kim Gordano kept honing in on the idea that if you vote for me, it means keeping your taxes low. You vote for him, it means raising taxes. Do you believe that? I believe that, well, I can't speak for everyone, but taxes I don't think is something that really scares young people too much because that's something that we don't really experience right away. But at the same time, if you promise me that if I pay higher taxes, I'm going to get further government benefits in the future, then that's not something that's really going to scare me. I, I also agree with what Wyatt said. When it comes to taxing, it's something that we just don't focus on as young people. But at the same time, the way I see it is if my taxes are going towards something that I care about, like college, you know, college debt or going toward like legalization of uh, recreational marijuana, then I will be more than willing to pay higher taxes. But for example, as Kelly said before, if we're lowering taxes, what are we taking money out of when it comes to funding? So that's what, I think lowering taxes scares me more than raising taxes, honestly. Well, I mean, a thing too is that, you know, New Jersey right now lacks the financial resources to honor these pensions for state employees. And the next governor is going to have to make choices that are, you know, directly impact that. And to promise to lower property taxes, I think she said, on average, it's going to affect, you know, the average uh, taxpayer It'll, it'll save them $800 a year. When you break down $800 a year, it ends up being $15 a week. That is not enough. That doesn't even pay for a college course. $800 is not, you know, if you sit there and you're going to say, okay, we're just going to cut this, property taxes, you're not really focusing in on the issues. I believe New Jersey has one of the highest property taxes in the nation. Mm -hmm. And it is true that while anybody who rents don't have to face that face to face. You're still paying them. You're still paying them <laughs> in some scale in your rent. It's folded in. Uh, so property taxes in this state, number four, we are among the very highest in 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 50 states. So the question of taxes falls right into the issue of how can you attract major industry to come in here when business taxes are are high. Now, Murphy says, we're going to change that. We're going to make hedge fund owners and, and the high-income people pay for it. And the other position is, from the lieutenant governor, no, uh, we're going to lower taxes. At the bottom of this scale, we all sit. And at some point, we're going to either have to pay one way or another because the state is in debt, right? And you are the future of this state.
right? So how would you prefer taxes to be raised now or later, or is that prohibitive? Or would you think the idea of lowering taxes is more of an incentive going forward for this state? I think Lieutenant Wadano made unrealistic promises. Um, I think the $800 um, tax relief is it's nonsense, to be quite honest. And Phil Murphy says that he would raise the taxes in order to fund public schools and to for it to go to K-12 to programs. So if we were to raise taxes for that, then it would be relevant. However, not what the lieutenant but promised. But I think the key is who are you raising those taxes on? Are you raising exactly. them on the middle class or are you finally going to, you know, for example, in 2016, New Jersey's political leaders eliminated the state's estate tax. Mm -hmm. That only that only affects the the well-off and the wealthy. That doesn't, you know, when you completely give them a, a cut like that, you deprive the state of over 500 million a year in lost revenue. And then, in addition to that, uh, legislature allowed New Jersey's temporary income tax surcharge on the state's wealthiest households to expire. Governor Christie and Kim Guadagno, their administration, they vetoed every attempt for legislature to thereafter make income tax more equitable. They forfeited up to what could have been seven billion dollars in revenue. So, I mean, it's not just a matter of oh. Is he going to raise taxes? Who is he going to raise taxes on? And on top of that, there's also the corporate tax loopholes mm -hmm. that all of these companies are getting. You know, if there's somebody that has um, a multi-state corporation and they don't want to pay the taxes in New Jersey, they simply shift their profits to a state where the taxes are lower or there's none at all for a corporate. That's right. For corporations. So let's come at this another way. Let's flip the coin over. And um, there was a pattern, I think, and we heard tonight about talking about um, the underfunded pensions. Un underfunded public schools, underfunded transportation. If we consider those to all be public sector investments instead of um, ill-spent dollars, <laughs> um, then can we think about this taxation issue, as you all sort of hinted to earlier, um, as one that enriches the lives of not just the older people in the state, but really is an investment in the young. So public education, higher education, transportation, and by the way, that's an environmental issue. Um, and then, you know, we talked, there were a number of other issues. So income taxes, corporate taxes are not property taxes, right? So how would you, what is the state you would want to live in what kind of revenues, right? Where would you place your the priority for spending um, if you could? Education, um, education, environmental issues. Um, education in the sense that that in 11, uh, the New York Times did an article in 2016 to where it said that 11,000 students leave the state to go to college. Mm -hmm. So kind of revitalizing our state institutions would actually be a big help. Um, and along with also investing in the environment, you can create a whole new industry if you actually invest in building wind turbines, if you start making buildings more environmentally accessible and start building houses that are, are designed to take advantage of where they are environmentally speaking. So I think there's a chance for new industry there. So that's where I'd like to see those investment, investments are. How do we, I'd like to ask about marijuana legalization. How do we side on this? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Uh, obviously, there's a question of uh, this being an opportunity, legalizing it to develop more tax uh, tax base. But on the other side, there are issues about the implications of marijuana being legalized in this state. Your generation uh, has a different fix. I grew up in the 60s, and for us, my generation, marijuana meant something else. So what do you think? It also had lower THC levels oh. back then. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely agree with what Godano had to say about decriminalizing mar marijuana, getting the nonviolent people with, drug, with minor drug charges just having marijuana who are sitting in jail, get them out of jail. But I don't agree with what Murphy had to say with legalizing it and taxing it. I think we're already stretched thin. You can't tax us again with the marijuana. So instead, I definitely think that decriminalizing it's the way to go. Yeah, but we, we wouldn't be taxed. It would be the people that needed it for medical purposes or for 
you know, right, any, right. it would be Ratio. anyone, right. anyone that goes for, like yeah, if you go to a dispensary, tax, right. that's where you're going to see the tax. The, the yeah. sellers would it's be a whole, right. It's a whole new revenue. And, and that's not that, something we yeah. should ever run away from. Uh, we have $98 billion in debt, so we should try to find ways to create new revenue streams. So and I'm going right. to sound like an old-fashioned person here um, on both sides of the drug uh, discussion, which is that um, we have this massive opioid crisis in this state and in this country. It's, um, you know, I just saw a report with the mapping from 2013 versus last year, a shocking even increase in just that space of time. So our legal for big business for big pharma, some people refer to it, um, uh, as really being one of the purveyors of that drug. And then this other discussion at the same time around marijuana. Um, and so here's my old fashioned moment. Um, does marijuana, which it has much higher THC levels today than it did as in the years that many of the people making these decisions, um, the age they were when it, they were most likely to have encountered it. So um, does that mean that it should be regulated, not just legalized, if you're going to legalize it? Should there be laws about safety, about as we do with alcohol? Uh, how do you regulate marijuana? Absolutely. I think it should be regulated. I, if we've seen the current administration and the past administration, it's only included an emphasis on the enforcement rather than the treatment. And that's not how you pursue an epidemic. That's not how you fix it. Um, the opioid addiction begins legally. Doctors prescri prescribe it and pharmaceutical companies enforce it because they benefit from it. President Trump has previously stated that this drug crisis that we have is because of the borders that are open. However, this is an epidemic that's happening here at home and it's not being addressed. Can so I add to marijuana, that actually? Go ahead. Uh, marijuana is highly effective at treating the same types of chronic pain that uh, patients that are often prescribed opiates. It, it's, the, it's very similar in terms of treating those sort of chronic pain problems. So from a public health standpoint, this is a positive development because considering that marijuana carries essentially zero risk of fatal overdose. This is something that they can actually, this could actually help the ep epidemic of opiate use in New Jersey, so. Well, I will say so this, that. those of us who grew up with images and icons of Hollywood stars smoking, yeah. smoking, <laughs> smoking away, it took six, more than 60 years mm -hmm. for the tobacco industry to acknowledge that there is an issue, 60 years. And having seen what this country went through to discover the link between lung cancer and tobacco, mm -hmm. my concern, being mm -hmm. of the older generation, is that time has not proven marijuana to be as safe as people say it is now. I think extended usage will imply other issues that our society will have to answer to. This is the same it's thing we not know a free about. Ride. We do know this about alcohol as right. well. It's a alcohol dangerous is substance. Thing. We regulate it. Yes. And the fact is that right now it is an unregulated growing industry, and many young people don't know what pesticides they're smoking. Right. So these are all the kinds of things that legalization, not decriminalization, would allow the public to um, sort of look at. So w on one hand, we have this some somewhat minor drug impact considering deaths. Um, and we're struggling over some kind of regulatory discussion, perhaps. And then over here, we have this opioid crisis. Right. What would you do? Because I, I, I rarely meet a student anymore in the classroom who doesn't know someone, a friend, a cousin, uh, someone in their circles who has not been touched by this crisis. What would you do? Uh, to stem the prescription opioid pipeline. Can, is there a link between that, that legalization and the usage of uh, opioids, because it's legal, just by prescription, well, and marijuana? Yeah. Are we going down a similar path without knowing? 250,000 million prescriptions are written every year. That's enough for every American to have a bottle of pills. And that bottle of pills is not just sitting in their counter. It's either falling into their hands or somebody else's hands. I think legalization leads to regulation. And I think that that's the way to go. 
I agree with that, and I will say that New Jersey has some of the stricter opioid laws that Christy just signed uh, earlier in the year to where doctors are prescribing less, and, it, it, and they're also less potent, and that's, that was pretty important as well. It's actually not, unfortunately, the, 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 we haven't seen the effects yet, right. um, but there is, uh, you know, I saw this report, and there were 9 million pills shipped to one town in West Virginia legally. Um, so this pipeline from the pharmaceutical companies, you know, how do we halt the profitability of um, our children dying, yeah. which is really what we're looking at. And is this, if we turn the page, is marijuana the next issue related to this? Well, and, and marijuana isn't fatal. It doesn't isn't have fatal. Overdoses. We don't know, but yeah. the long-term effects are still need to be well, tested. we also have you know, states that have already enacted legislation where it's legalized, so we can kind of use them as test subjects. Most of them don't have a regulatory component, so I think that's one of the things that yeah. we're sort of asking for, which is, you know, I often uh, joke with students when I get to that Fourth Amendment part of the American government about being pulled over, um, you know, rarely do we see people kill each other in vehicles um, as a result of just smoking marijuana. And I joke sometimes that they may stop at the green light, <laughs> but they um, generally don't kill themselves or others. When it's mixed with other substances, that's a different story. I'd, I'd like to... How did we get here? Yeah. Come on. I'd, I'd, I'd like to pull back a little bit and say, we just spent an hour looking at two individuals, one of whom will be our next governor. So very quickly, and this may be a false choice question, I'd like you to tell me who you think came out ahead after that one hour debate and why. Based, and we're going to ask all of you. So Christina, why don't you start? Well, uh, I personally think Murphy came out ahead. Uh, because my personal preference, he, he addressed things that were in my interest, you know, uh, that I favored, such as the legalization of marijuana, um, such as immigration and, you know, sanctuary state issue. Um, while Guadano, I feel like just, I, she, she didn't, I feel like she didn't have any plan. While Murphy did have plans that did have flaws in it, which I, I, I totally see um, as a disadvantage, uh, I, I just did not see a positive plan coming from Guadano. So I, I think I would side with Murphy. So, Murphy. And did you, coming in, did you have any thoughts about which way you leaned? Did it change anything? It did not. I, I, I definitely came in with thoughts of which side I leaned in. The debate did not change that at all. Okay. Murphy should keep his lead in the polls. Um, but Murphy, Murphy's ultimate problem will be that he fell into some of the traps that national politics have to where it's really blaming and, you know, taking unnecessary swings instead of actually talking to his constituents. That, but Murphy should keep his lead. So you felt Mel Murphy, again, uh, did the better job tonight? I felt that neither candidate inspired the way they should have. Um, unfortunately, I feel like I can't side right now with either. Coming in, I felt like I wanted to be with Murphy, but I feel like he disappointed me, and I feel like they both didn't answer a lot of questions that I was looking for. So instead of this debate helping me, it kind of just pushed me back more. Interesting. Me? Kelly? Um, I kind of agree. I, I agree with that. I don't think anyone really came off strong. Um, the thing that I will say is that Kim Godano keeps you know, saying she has a plan for certain things, and then I just don't always feel that those are the, the best plans for long-term situations. Whereas Phil Murphy keeps saying he wants to identify with the facts. He wants to, you know, do his homework. And that's something I can appreciate. You know, I think it's important that if you're going to be running a, a state and you're going to be making big decisions that really affect people on various different levels, it is important to do your homework. It is important to look at those reports. Did you have a preference coming in? Um, I did. <laughs> um, I think the two candidates failed to address the questions that were posted. None of them provided a concrete or substantial plan. Um, while Phil Murphy did address some interesting points in regards to student debt, that that was the highlight of the night for me, I believe that the October 10th debate was actually a lot more well executed. This debate, there was a lot of bickering on both sides, and I feel like they both fell into that trap. I would have to say that Murphy came across as very unprofessional to me. I think that he delivered a lot of low blows to Guadano, and I think Guadano did a good job in deflecting these low blows. I think 
when Murphy said he wanted to identify with facts and wanted to talk about the facts, but he didn't actually state any facts that I heard during the debate, I definitely think, I mean, neither candidate really did that much. So the debate definitely wasn't very factual, but I definitely think that there was one candidate who definitely came out ahead, and I think that was Guadana. Okay. Did you have a choice? I definitely had a, a um, opinion. <laughs> Questions? Sure. If we have time, um, which is we're living in an era of very uncivil politics, some would observe. And um, we just spoke about the lack of integration of young people into the party system and the fact that even those of you who do vote, you have very low party identification. Um, and tonight on the stage, we heard some what one might call low blows or interruptions or sort of snarky comments. But we also heard some very loud interruptions from the audience. How important is civility in community, in politics to you as part of the process? Does that turn you off or bring you in? Is it a, is it a measure for you? I think it's extremely important. I mean, I think the reason why we're so divided today is because of the lack of civility, the lack of being able to talk to people with, uh, you know, opposing views. I think that's the huge problem. I mean, we did have protesters outside of uh, uh, the uh, Shea Auditorium today, uh, one from Gudano and one uh, from Murphy, just yelling at each other. And I, and I just kind of find it ridiculous that we, we can't just sit down and have a civil conversation about our opposing views. Um, I think it's the most important thing. I mean, in the same way, it is engaging. That's the weird part. It's because I feel like I became politically engaged during the 2016 election the most, where the least amount of civility took place. Um, but it kind of does encourage you to listen to the other side, to understand the other side. Um, so I definitely think it's a huge part. Do you think 2016 was contentious and uncivil? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, compare. Yeah. Oh, uh, pardon. You know what? I, for some reason, I thought you were dis you. For some reason, I thought you were referencing 12. Oh, Forgive no, me. No, no, no. I was like, I, it I was, was say, you know, by today's a, a 20, by yeah. 2016 <laughs> standards, 12 was quite tame. Exactly. I, don't I mean, know why I this that. debate was quite tame compared to a 2016 debate. You know. <laughs> um, so I, I, it's Forgive definitely me. extremely that important. Yeah. Yeah. I would have to agree with what you said. I think that politics today has become who can yell their opinion the loudest. The loudest person wins in the room. I think that we definitely need to sit down and we need to hear the other side. I mean, I know everybody probably here is guilty about this, you know, just hearing your opinion and just getting so tunnel vision on your side of things that you don't actually listen to the other side. And I think that this debate was definitely more civil and you were able to hear the other side better than in the 2016 elections, which mm -hmm. definitely was mm -hmm. the epitome of uncivility. Yeah, politics aren't supposed to, we're not supposed to root for our teams in politics. We're actually supposed to listen to both sides and come to some sort of balance and agreement. And quite honestly, when I hear the uncivility, and even from the crowd and from the candidates, I mean, the person who said, answer the question during the debate today, that was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and he should be embarrassed, whoever said that. Uh, so there needs to be a level of civility, and I hope we can go back to that. I think we can connect the dots and say that before President Trump, there wasn't really a personhood or something that we attacked directly towards a person. It was more where which party we affiliated with. Um, however, because he did make everything about himself, we do that now, and we do attack the individual and where we can't have a conversation because we have such opposing views. Social media as a platform is often blamed or accredited uh, with the describing the millennial disposition, which is often, you know, uh, output, not interchange. And I'm really, I'm really, um, I say, moved by your comments about civility and the need for um, discussion, even when you passionately disagree. I think, um, I think those are great thoughts for us to conclude on. So I thank everybody for joining our panel discussion. This, uh, our time is up. So I'd like to say thank you to Professor Kelly, to the students, and most of all to IRT for putting on this, helping us put on this wonderful show. Most of all, vote November 7th. Good night.